Now, in the last few years, since the end of the Star Wars sequel trilogy, basically, actor John Boyega has had quite a bit to say about his time and or experience as the character Finn, and how he feels he and his character were treated by Disney and Lucasfilm, as well as treated by the fans. He's also, in that time, talked quite a bit about whether or not he'd ever return to the franchise, one saying days after the release of The Rise of Skywalker that, you ain't going to Disney plus me, basically meaning he had no interest in ever being on that streaming platform. But then, last year, last May, he sounded a little more open to the idea of coming back to Star Wars in general, under the right conditions, that is, saying at the time that, Whichever way, I am open to the conversation as long as it is Kathleen, JJ, and maybe someone else and the team. It's a no-brainer. However, in a recent podcast appearance, a link to the portion of it I'll be referencing in this video in the description below, he made it sound like no matter what, he's pretty much just done with Star Wars. That he's good with the character, and that it's maybe time for Finn to be explored in books, comics, animated shows, or whatever but that he is personally done with him and has got other things he'd rather do or focus his career on. Though the main reason he apparently feels this way is because of how the character was handled, which is very poorly in his opinion, which is an opinion I'd say most fans absolutely share. And he feels this way especially after they teased him in that first teaser trailer for The Force Awakens to have a very big and important role in the then upcoming sequel trilogy, after being shown with a lightsaber ready to fight the new villain of the trilogy, Kylo Ren, at the very end of that aforementioned trailer. And there's even a video from back then where Boyega reacts quite excitedly to seeing himself in this trailer, as you'd probably expect anyone to react after seeing themselves with a lightsaber in a Star Wars trailer. But anyway, in this podcast appearance, he even talks about how that trailer was a sort of bait and switch, done essentially to get people excited for a black character getting a prominent role in Star Wars, that it was only done to lure people in to, as he basically says in this interview, to get black people excited for a black Jedi. But that there was no real intent or actual plan to do anything with him, while for some of his fellow sequel trilogy actors, the white ones as he says, there was a plan for them or their characters, that while they all had good story arcs, his character was relegated to tying up a loose end. And though I get and understand his grievances here, he absolutely was initially marketed to have a bigger and better role than he ultimately did end up with, though you could say the same about a lot of characters, like Captain Phasma, who may have ended up being the most worthless character in the whole trilogy, which is by no means a knock against Gwendolyn Christie, who played her. Anyway, I don't think, in fact, we pretty much know that there was no sort of real solid game plan in place either for the story or any of the characters of the sequel trilogy. They were just kind of making it up as they went, leaving it up to the individual writers on the individual films of the trilogy to figure out the story and what to do with these characters. The writers more or less just did what they wanted with the films that they had control over. Which, from start to finish, made the whole trilogy one giant discombobulated mess. In other words, I'm not sure their thought process going into it was, make sure we do something good and interesting with the white characters, but don't worry so much about any of the others. Or that when things were going south with the story, which you could say was the case after The Last Jedi, they thought, do something with the white characters, but don't worry about any of the other ones. Quite honestly, I think the idea from the start, the hope you could say, was to magically make all the characters good and to give them all a worthy story, and when the whole thing became damage control in or with the rise of Skywalker, well, yeah, I think they put most of their energy into trying the best they could to create something meaningful and interesting, mainly between the characters of Rey and Kylo Ren, which they either failed or succeeded at, depending on your point of view, I suppose. But I mean, really, what were they going to do at that point, going into the last film after The Last Jedi had sort of painted the whole thing into a corner and placed the whole story on the shoulders of those two characters, which, if I may point out, was done by Ryan Johnson. He was the one who wrote that film, and thus he's the one who sent Finn on a pointless side quest and left his story at a pretty much a dead end. That may even be why when John Boyega talked about, a year ago, what would bring him back to the franchise, that he went on to say J.J. Abrams would have to be involved because he felt like J.J. put more thought and effort into his character than Ryan Johnson had, but who knows for sure. 
Either way, and to get back on track, to go back to that trailer for The Force Awakens where at the end of it, Finn has the Skywalker saber and is about to confront Kylo Ren, it seems. I do think that, yeah, part of that was to hype up Finn and to get the black audience excited or to bring them into the theater. Not that there weren't plenty of black fans of Star Wars before this. That would be ridiculous to imply. And so let's be real about it. For a company like Disney, diversity is not only marketable in this day and age, but it means they can mask their pandering to different groups by claiming it's some kind of greater good. But the truth is, when a company like Disney says they care about diversity, it really means the diversity of the type of people they can make money off of. Because I guarantee you that, by and large, the majority of shareholders that the Disney execs have a fiduciary responsibility to those at the very end of the rainbow, the people who really own and control Disney, they don't care about diversity, they care about making money. They care more about the fact that a film like Black Panther, for example, made $1.3 billion at the box office, not what it meant to the black community. But anyway, to get back on track here, it's also possible the Finn bait and switch at the end of the Force Awakens trailer was also done to sort of hide the fact that Rey was going to be, for better or worse, our new main character. And no, I'm not really trying to defend their decision, but for some reason they did try to kind of hide the fact in the marketing for Episode 7 that Rey was going to be as important as she turned out to be, even though we sort of already knew she was going to be very important. We even had Kathleen Kennedy talking about how important it was for Star Wars to have a female lead character. So I'm not sure why it was supposed to be some kind of secret, yet not a secret. Also, plenty of trailers do a bait and switch of some kind. Hell, almost all trailers have some level of deception, or, I mean, clever editing, to get people excited and to eventually watch. Though yeah, like I said, I get his grievance in this particular case, that it's not cool to do that with a black actor or character, because it did give the impression that Finn was going to end up a Jedi, not that there's never been a black Jedi before, but we haven't got a black main character in Star Wars, so that is an exciting prospect. Though, at the same time, I don't think just because you do use a black actor or character that they, the creators, have some sort of obligation to use them a certain way. This is what some people get upset about when it comes to diversity, or forced diversity, you might want to call it. The idea that because the actor is a certain color, or gender, or whatever, that their character in story then has to be handled a certain way. That Finn had to have a profound character arc, not because it was needed for the story, but because of the color of the actor playing him. And again, don't get me wrong here, the trailer did imply this, did imply his importance, so I very much get his frustration and the frustration of anyone else who was very excited for the character. I was excited for the character. I liked the idea of a stormtrooper becoming a Jedi. It's been done in the Expanded Universe very well, so I was eager to see what could be done with it on the big screen. I also get that representation can be very important. I've even argued many, many times before why representation just makes sense in Star Wars, where you have a galaxy full of humans, so many different planets full of humans, so of course they will come in all shapes, sizes, colors, sexualities, genders, and so on. Go ahead and bring in the full gambit. It makes sense. But the counter-argument here is that no matter what, the story should always come first, not the actor because of their skin color or, again, anything else. The Rise of Skywalker shouldn't have gone out of its way to do something important with Finn just because he was played by a black man. It needed to make the best possible story it could out of everything it had to work with, which, as I was saying before, wasn't much or was kind of a mess after The Last Jedi had abandoned most of the Force Awakens setups. Though that said, again, considering how interesting the idea seemed to be for Finn, a stormtrooper turning Jedi, he absolutely could have and should have had more done with him leading up to that film, so that something profound could have been done with him in the final movie. Basically, to put it as bluntly as I can, it wasn't intent or lack of caring about his character because of the color that destroyed Finn's character or chance to be something great. It was incompetence out of the people involved in the making of those sequels. A whole lot of people. His character wasn't even close to the only one failed by those movies. And so, moving on then, in this podcast, John Boyega also talked about the way Disney responded or didn't respond to the racist backlash he and his character faced back when the films were coming out, basically saying they didn't have any sort of plan in place and that when it happened, they wanted to simply kind of ignore it. And that with Moses Ingram, who played Reva in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, they did have a plan and did have her back, which he was thankful for and glad to see that they had changed. 
He was glad to see they came to her defense by having the official Star Wars Twitter account express their support for her and condemn racism, which was very bold of them to condemn racism, something I think every decent human being is already against. And look, I don't want to in any way downplay racist remarks sent to either one of them or anybody else on this entire planet. It's absolutely a horrible thing to have happen, not to mention just sad and pathetic, out of the people who do it. And that's the reason why, and this is not meant as a defense of Disney, they did things like shrink Finn on the Chinese poster for The Force Awakens, but that's the reason why I'm not entirely sure responding to it or acknowledging it is always the best course of action. And no, I'm not saying that Disney or Lucasfilm's stance when it was happening to John Boyega was the appropriate one to just kind of shut up and let him take it, but a reaction is exactly what the people who send this sort of thing want. They thrive on responses. It goes along with that saying of, don't feed the trolls, because that's the only way they can actually win, by knowing their pathetic messages were read by their target and that it got to them on some level. Not to mention, what exactly does a multi-billion dollar corporation tweeting their support of an actor and condemnation of racism actually mean or accomplish in the grand scheme of things? Do you think even one single racist person out there who saw that or saw you and McGregor respond to it as well thought to themselves afterwards, Obi-Wan and the Star Wars Twitter account said racism is bad. I now need to go home and rethink my life. And sure, it probably makes the targeted actor or actress feel better to some degree, knowing they have support of, again, a mega corporation and the support of a fellow actor, which I would say goes a lot further. And yes, their well-being and keeping them safe from a potential legitimate threat from someone is extremely important. I hope that when they say that Disney and or Lucasfilm now have a plan in place, it's to actually do something should, again, a credible and legitimate threat get made, not that the plan is to tweet their solidarity again. Because um, I hate to break it to them over at Disney and Lucasfilm, but Twitter is not reality. If anything, it's the exact opposite of that. Twitter is a place where all too often grown-ass men and women devolve into little more than squabbling children, trying to one-up each other with attempted witty comments that are 280 characters or less. It tends to bring out the very worst in people, and is in no way indicative or should be indicative of people or the way we should behave or treat each other. In other words here, and even though, yes, even one racist comment is too many, I don't know that the Star Wars Twitter account coming to the defense of Moses Ingram after she received apparently hundreds of messages on social media, and do keep in mind we are talking about a fan base of millions and millions of people, not that someone who sends a racist comment even gets to call themselves a Star Wars fan anymore. But anyway, I don't know that now, suddenly, because... Disney condemned racism on Twitter, that we're winning the battle on racism. If anything, as I said, it only feeds the trolls. It lets them know they do get their message across, or to Moses Ingram, and that, for better or worse, it does bother her, which it probably should, don't get me wrong. But again, letting everybody know that, letting the trolls know that, is exactly the ammunition they need to keep firing and firing again. Well, that's all I've got for you this time. Now it's your turn to tell me what you think about all of this. So do take to the comments below and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.